I was going to continue along the lines I have been, bring you updates regarding for the last three or four weeks, and specifically to do some more tossing of the conspiracy salad. And I can hear some of you now asking yourselves, if not me, if indeed I'm referring to some string of physical external events, or am I speaking merely as an intellectual apotheosis? Although I doubt if anybody would ask me if it was actually an apotheosis, but they should have. I'm going to expand what I've been talking about, and who knows whether we're talking about, as I said, real external events. I tried to bring that up last week, but I've forgotten what I said, and I'm sure you have now. Nobody knows where they are. <laughs> if it made any difference, it makes some difference. If it made any difference, I would make some difference out of it. But we'll get to that eventually when I wrap all this up. Let's assume that I, this, this is play, fairy tale time. Let's assume that I have the conspiracy handbook that I have found the conspiracy book wherein all of the tales, all the suspicions, the rumors, the brutes, the canards have all been put, to get, put down. And then this is the actual group of conspirators. Now, who knows what the hell we're talking about? You know, the Illuminati, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, the elders of Zion, the Knights of Jerusalem, the Society of the Bloody Hand, Muhammad's family, the Council of Constantine. Who knows? But if there was, as everyone has, or many people suspect, and almost everybody agrees to when they hear it, that behind the visible actions of humanity, individually and collectively, institutionally, is this grave suspicion that there's a little group of people somewhere that's running everything and have always been running everything and are not necessarily looking after our best interest, right? Okay, so let's assume that I had access and that kind of a book, I haven't written it down, although I could, but let's assume that this is sort of a handbook that this group, and the group is not in the ones I just named, even if at one time it was named that, as soon as the name got out, I assure you if there was such a conspiracy, they dropped that name like a bad habit. But let's assume that somebody in such a group collected sort of the rules, the little laws, the governing conditions, pointing out ways they operate, ways humanity believes things are going as opposed to the way that they're seeing how they're really going, along those lines. So let's assume that I was sort of relaying information to you from this book of which, to which I had access. All right, so expanding and refining a little bit, or at least expanding some of the terms that I was, have been using for the last several weeks that have normally been used, I'm going to sort of codify them in this, remember, make-believe. This make-believe conspiracy handbook that I found, that I had access to. I wouldn't find it. If there was such a book, I assure you they wouldn't lose it. They wouldn't just lay it around and we casually pick it up. So remember all this is just make believe anyway. All right, I have pointed out to you several among several binary divisions of humanity into such things as the dominant group of people, those who apparently are submissive. I've even referred to it as those who seek to be submissive. I referred to a great division of the powerful and the powerless. All of these binary divisions, of course, are sorely lacking because there are always at least three. But now let me refine it and expand it from this make-believe conspiracy handbook. And Let's say it goes something like this. In my previous 
descriptions of the powerful and the powerless. For the last couple of weeks, every time I've mentioned it, if I wanted to throw around a figure, I was saying things like 93% the powerless, all of us, and 7% of the powerful. And that figure is not as close as I could make it, but I was going to give you several weeks. A few people bit, a few people responded, a few people sent me notes, guessing along the same line of playing, like if there was a conspiracy, if there are a group of powerful people running the world, even the visible part, that that figure you took umbrage with. But not enough of you did it, nobody seemed to get anything great, so I'm going to clarify it a little bit. If we were dealing with simply a binary situation, speaking externally, visibly, into the powerful and the powerless, the leaders and the led, you'd really be talking about a figure closer to this. You'd be talking about 96% and 4%. If we were dealing with just the external appearances of power, those in control of situations, money, position, the exercise of authority. But now let me expand. And instead of talking about the powerful and the powerless, let's talk about three groups and bring in a new figure. Let's talk about real power in one group. Now let's talk about little case letter power, apparent power. I might also refer to it before the evening's over as control. And then let's talk about a third, because there's always a third, and that would be the restless. I might even refer to it before the night's over as the rebellious. Now, I have changed the scope of my discussion based upon this fictitious conspiracy handbook now, because here's what we're talking about now. Real power, we'd be talking about a figure closer to this. Apparent power, we'd be talking about figure closer to this. Okay. And the restless, the rebellious, would be talking about some percentage of this. Is this big enough to show up on the camera? Not quite. Can you run up and get it, or shall I redo it? What? Real power, 0.04%. Apparent power. That's the power, if we were back to my binary of the powerful and the powerless, this is that group. That's the ones out in life, the 6%, I mean the 4%, that apparently have got power. But once you expand this, you see where they are. They are powerless, really, compared to this. And that makes up approximately 99.96%. Then is the restless, the rebellious, the would-be revolutionaries. And there are some percentage of this. Whatever percentage they're making up at any given time is coming out of this, not that. In this scenario, I might also go ahead and point out, this kind of activity is in a non-Euclidean corner of this. That is, the restless, the rebellious. They are indeed, remember we're getting really into the depths of this now due to the fact that I have this make-believe conspiracy handbook, that we're now talking about real power, consider it with a capital R and a capital P, and then we're talking about apparent power, little p. Real power is invisible. The closer you get to real power, the less visible it is. You can take it from the handbook, believe me, after me reading it, 
very carefully. I can tell you this, if you can see it, it's not real power. You can carry that to the bank. Because any bank you find is not going to be real power anyway, so it doesn't matter what you put in it. Real power has authority to it. Real power would be acting, if this were true, on a three-dimensional level. Real power would be that which could act as a cause, whereas apparent power, that is the power less, and then the restless, including a percentage of the former, would be, compared to real power, they would simply be effects. Even if real power was seen, if there was some group out of the real power out of the 0.04% that happened to get their photograph made somewhere with a group of other people, if they were seen, even photographed, they would never be identified or recognized as real power. Never. If they're identified as powerful, they're not. If they're identified as being in control, which I'm using, as I warned you, I may use it synonymously. If I do, it will be synonymous with capital, I mean, little case P, a power, power. It's those who seem to be in control. So you can lose control, but power is permanent. <laughs> Tyrants come and go, presidents come and go, popes come and go, bikers come and go. Everybody comes and goes if they simply have apparent power. You can get it, you can lose it. You're apparently in control now, you may be apparently in control 20 years, you may be apparently in control of something until you die. But you can lose control. And the real power, the 0.04%, is permanent. The powerless, that is, those with apparent power and those who are simply rebellious, they see the division only in the two. That's why it sounded all right until I brought this up tonight. As long as you're part of the powerless, the only thing you can see is, hey, there's us and then those who seem to have some power. There's us and then there seems to be some of those in control. Bankers, they're in control of money if I want a loan. Religious leaders, they seem to be in control of our possible connection with higher forces, with gods. Uh, political leaders, they seem to be in control of my ultimate financial situation. If you lived in a place that does not even have the semblance of some sort of freedom, you could say that the dictatorial controllers, those in apparent power, have control over my very life. So the powerless see the situation strictly as binary. It's me and then it's a few people that seem to be in control of everything. Of course, they're wrong. They're right on a binary level, but they don't see anything. That won't get you anywhere. It doesn't explain anything. Of course, I'll tell you in this fictitious conspirator's handbook, it points out what a delightful situation that is. Because that keeps the powerless, among other things, from ever being too upset. As long as you're faced with a possible binary struggle, the powerless will stay okay. Everybody will stay okay. You'll accept defeat. You'll accept discouragement. You'll accept things as they are. And this kind of expanded description, you could look at as being the true triaxiality of power. I could parallel it back to our factory of humanity. You could look at the controllers. I'm fixing to jump sideways, so listen. You could look at the controllers as management, that is, the power, apparent powerful. But now I'm going to turn this triad into three over here without this one. Is the apparent powerful, the controllers would be like management. Then you would have a new class of the powerless, and they would be I'll give you two descriptions that will cover them all. They are powerless. They are like the passive 
broom pushers, there are those who are on salary, who show up and do a minimal amount of work, that is, they live a minimal life. They know they can be fired. They know that they're hanging on by a thread. They apparently have have just given up and resigned themselves to it. And they will do just enough to keep their job. Slice, and along with that group, are those who are impotent bitchers. Same thing. Both of those groups are the powerless, and they accept it. The third group then would be the restless, and they would be like the union. They would be like the would-be unionizers, and they would be like the fervent union men and women. It would be those that, in a sense, would be in charge of keeping the tension going between the first two groups. And in this scenario, the union people, the restless, they are seeking to become powerful. Whereas the second group, the powerless, the passive broom pushers and the harmless bitchers, they're not seeking power. If it was an open shop community, they would not even join a union. They just laugh at it. It's a waste of time. It's not going to get you anywhere. They are not seeking to join the powerful. Not that they know more. It's just it requires three groups to get anything going in a 4D world. So that's one of the groups. To remain powerless through the first three triad or through this one, to remain powerless requires not only that you have your reality defined for and forced on you, as I sketched some for the last two weeks, but it's also in having all of your apparent individual ideas and concepts subject to all manner of assessment, regulation, and condemnation. Now this situation is very subtle, but once you see it, it's just an astounding other stroke based upon this fictitious conspirator's handbook that among the ordinary, that is among the powerless, even among those with, cap with little p power, and then among the restless, among all the ordinary, you're kept ordinary, you're kept helpless, you're kept powerless, among several ways I can describe, based on this book, by having your own reality defined for you, forced on you, but then if that wasn't enough, which by God it should be, but if that wasn't enough, then the sense of induced, forced reality, externally defined, other defined, that you have now been forced to accept if you're ordinary. On top of that, then everything that seems to spring internally in you from the sense of reality, all of your apparent personal ideas, all of your apparently individual concepts, notions, opinions, theories, they are all subject continually to a dazzling array of assessment, regulation, and condemnation. Nobody can see the beauty in that. That, if I may paraphrase and condense this handbooks, and it's, since it's fictitious, I certainly can. Nobody can sue me. It's as though somebody said, all right, here are all of your personal ideas, all the thoughts, all the notions, all the dreams, all the fanciful thoughts you may ever have. Here they are. 
and go ahead and pack their yours, but they're not. Here, take them. That's all you got, and you take them. And then, as soon as they apparently begin to run through your system, and you apparently seem to have an idea, you express an opinion about a painting, music, politics, your fellow man, the nature of life, then is this constant barrage, and it's from the same source, is what I'm telling you, that all of them are immediately subject to being, this is either or. They're assessed continually by somebody. They're regulated, they're kept within check, and they're condemned continually. Now, if you still see the beauty of it enough, it's as though you found yourself to be a conscious human being and you find yourself, you look down and find yourself in the shape, according to the Torah of Adam and Eve, you find yourself naked and you find yourself suddenly ashamed and suddenly a hand came out of the clouds or out of the bushes or behind this big old tree of knowledge and hand you a suit of clothes. And you put it on, and as soon as you put it on, this hand began to laugh at it ridicule it, condemn it, tell you exactly how it should fit, continually assess it about the way you're wearing it, and that's the only damn suit you got. <laughs> and the same person that gave it to you now or the same what? Now subjects you continually. You cannot escape it unless you don't have a partnership. You cannot escape it that it's continually assessed, regulated, and condemned. Well, if this book existed, that would have been one of my favorite parts. That is, that is something. And it, and it almost fits reality. It almost fits the way things are, I guess, but that's not, that's not the point. Some more aspects that I am sort of instantaneously dragging from this book, the best I can remember it. Remember, i just making this up. That life itself, you know, remember we can't forget that because even the 0.04%, the real power, are still within the body of life. So life itself requires that the apparently powerful exert every molecule, bend every regulation, and exercise every jurisdiction and force to remain in power. That those apparently in control must do everything. Life demands it to stay in control and to keep the 99.96% at bay. They must do it. Since I brought out this part, as fast as I can talk and apparently think, I at first had no intention to dwell on this, but let me point out one interesting aspect of this, if it were true. How about the widespread, that is, from the ordinary sectors, from those who are powerless, that is, those with apparent power, and the restless? The widespread continuing historical verbal, literal, physical attacks on the apparent seats of power that everybody, that is, ordinary, seems to hate the rich, seems to hate the famous, seems to hate the idea that there is some power in charge, it would be only this third group, and that one triad of the restless, who are seeking to join them, who do not, jo who do not share this widespread, this across the board, sense of hatred, distrust, at what they perceive to be the powerful. But I have just told you, at least from what I read in this fictitious book, that they have no choice. 
That is part of being in control. That is part of being a, in positions of apparent power is that they are forced to do everything, everything, cheat, swindle, lie, kill, all those kind of words that humans have made up to do that. But it's not a psychological game of some kind. We're talking about balances of hormones. We're talking about why. There seems to be a dominant person in every group, whether they seem to be the pro-Hemingway literary society, whether they seem to be the Northwest Indiana Butterfly Society, whether it seems to be the reformed Nebraskan church of Lutherans turned Baptist. If there is a group and it's going to live, there is a dominant chimpanzee somewhere in that group. And what we're talking about is a balance of hormones. We're not talking about psychological games. We're not talking about suddenly somebody popped up and rolled to a power, whether it was in the Butterfly Society or in the Republican Party, by stepping on the humble, stepping on the little folks going up the ladder. There is no ladder. There are balances of hormones. The controllers, those in apparent power, also have another, or in another situation that I remember from reading that book that doesn't exist. That is that life requires the backing of real power to support the apparent power. Without it, those with apparent power lose it. Some other aspects, as I can recall them. Something else that is generally condemned by ordinary people is bureaucracy. It can be called other things, but you surely are intellectually hip enough to know what I'm referring to, that there seems to always be, back down to the ordinary level where it seems to be binary, that those in control and then those who are relatively helpless, the powerful and the powerless, as it would appear at ordinary level. That between those always springs a bureaucracy. And that's true not only in American government, that's true in communist governments, that's true in fascist governments, that's true in the Catholic Church. It's true everywhere that there is a seat of power within some group, some institution, some organization, those apparently in control of it, and then everybody else. The leader, the core of leaders, the followers. Between the two springs up almost immediately a systematic bureaucracy. And it's condemned, it's laughed at, but now let me take something from this god-awful conspirator's handbook and point out to you that it serves a real purpose. Bureaucracy helps keep the powerless far enough from the controllers, that is, those with apparent power, to keep up the illusion that the controllers have real power. That is the molecular basis of bureaucracy. You've got to keep the Pope away from the parishioners. You've got to keep a Mussolini away from the Italian people. You've got to keep the United States, apparently freely elected president, away from just people walking through the White House. If it were not so, then what is apparent power to the ordinary, that is to the powerless, would be seen to be no power at all. <laughs> that they would, if they got close enough, if you could just walk into the president of a bank 
and say, listen, I want $10,000 to do something that's none of your business. And they say, well, there's the guy that owns the whole bank. Go see him. You walk in and tell him that. And he says, fine. And he reaches in the pocket. Here it is. You know you can't do that. That is not the way life operates. <laughs> or for you to contact some bureau of the government and say, I pay taxes. I'm a taxpayer in good standing. I live here in this Republican slash Democratic country. And I need the services of the government in an area that I know there are such services. Health. Whatever it be. And they say, fine. And suddenly you find yourself in a morass, an uphill battle of bureaucracy. You cannot simply contact the head, the Surgeon General of the United States, or the cabinet head of the, the Secretary of whatever it is, Health, Education, and Welfare, or whatever it is now. You cannot simply go to that person. And they can have the person on TV in a part of the life's body such as ours and ask them about the bureaucracy and the person apparently in power, the head of HEW, the president-elect of the Southern Baptist Convention. They will decry, they will be moan along with the interviewer of the bureaucracy. I wish that I had time. I wish that things were arranged as I could deal with the little people, with my constituents, with those who need my help. I could deal with them on a one-to-one -one basis. But God knows that's not possible. You see the problems, and even the interviewer, he says, well, yeah, and that's not it. <laughs> Unless there is a sufficient step of removal between those with apparent power and everybody else, everybody else would realize that those in apparent power have no power, that the dictators have no power. The heads of banks, they can be recognized. They've got no power. Next time you want to laugh at bureaucracy, it's all right to get mad at it. The handbook covers that. Of course, I've hinted such as that. I didn't need the handbook that if things were arranged in a certain way, getting mad's okay. But you shouldn't be laughing at bureaucracy because it's serious. <laughs> Another aspect. is religion is generally supported by the powerful. Now remember this is generally supported by the little case P powerful and the real powerful. Because remember the apparent power has got to, if it stays in business, it's got to be backed by the real power. But religions generally, if you will note, are supported even in areas uh, circa 1987, the United States of America. So we got these binary groups arguing over whether the government should be close to a religious notion or whether it should be removed, and people refer to our so-called our written constitution and what it may or may not have meant initially. That is, whether the state has any business having anything to do with religion. That's just a Trump play again. You are misdirected because the powers that be, the apparent powers, generally. That's generally all the way to always. <laughs> are supporters of religion, if not a particular religion, of religion. I'm fixing to tell you how the book points out a certain, they don't have to point out the people that are in charge of the book already knew it, but there is a distinct connection between bureaucracy and religion. The religions are generally supported by the powerful and the apparently powerful. And it helps keep the powerless feeling that their positions of helplessness, of impotence, is relative to a non-material, faraway deity. Any of you that would have the nerve to laugh at religion, or to think it was useless, or to think it's outlived itself, or that it was originally some sort of bomb that those in power used to frighten the children and the illiterate, those with apparent power are the ones who said things like that. 
when they were out of apparent power. They're the ones who would believe something like that. They're the ones who would believe that there are psychological bases for being in control, for exercising a power, apparent power. They believe that there was some kind of psychological or intellectual trick, stroke of fate that brought them where they are. And they don't know any better. The powerless don't know any better. Only the 0.04% know any better and somewhere down in the restless. There is a group over at that non-geometrical obtuse edge. But as long as people believe, even without specifically analyzing it, as long as they are accepting the fact of the sensation, the suspicion that I am impotent, I am generally helpless, my life is not really under my control, but it's relative to not somebody else, not some other group. It's relative to a far away, a non-visible, a non-material. You cannot get your hands on it. You can't write the gods a letter. There's not a complaint department. As long as your feeling of impotence and helplessness is relative to that, it's as good as bureaucracy. It keeps the distance between you and apparent power and it certainly keeps the distance between you and real power if it existed like this fictitious book indicates it does. Another aspect I just gave a glancing blow to in the last several weeks. Since all of you people hearing this were born and raised in the land of the free and the brave, I could ask you, the apparent land of the free and the brave, how do you explain humanity, including this part of life's body, humanity's continuing love and fascination for royalty? I just heard a mention on the news in the last 48 hours of the growing significance and influence in France of a group now of pro-loyalist that want to bring back the monarchy. We're not talking about people on street corners and rags and people in insane asylums. Serious groups. And I assume you all know you cannot pick up a magazine aimed at the heart of the helpless. The grocery store rags, people magazines and such as that the heart of all of that is continually, here in other parts of the world, gossip, rumors, articles regarding royalty, would-be royalty, pretenders to royalty. How do you explain it? It is, I would suggest to you now, of course, I'm giving you a verbal description which makes it sound as though it's an intellectual, a psychological situation and all we're doing is talking about molecular hormonal balances for which there are no specific descriptions that seem to fit into intellectual and intellectual apotheosis. But the idea of royalty, of having a king a queen, a line, a hereditary line in which there is supreme power. And of course, a good king, a good queen, as soon as you see them, it's obvious that they believe it. If you think the stories you read back in college and history books, pretty run of the mill history books about the idea of divine anointment of kings, if you think that the kings and the queens sit around and believe that they made that up and it was a big joke and the serfs and the peons didn't know any better, you don't know any better. <coughs> you can even look at some of the long dead two-dimensional paintings five and six hundred years ago and if you cannot see that those people, the kings, how they were opposing and you could see, if you can see, that they took this as just a bare minimum of their just desserts that I'm the king and that's it. 
They accept it. And people bow down for no reason. They accept that. <laughs> people crawl on glass, give away all their possessions to come see the king, and beg the king, don't beat me, or someone beg the king, have me beaten, I'd love it. And it's all quite proper. It's quite proper from both perspectives. But back to what I was suggesting to you based upon this nine book that I didn't read. A love of royalty, the desire to have royalty somewhere. Then it gives the helpless the apparent visible reality of power. That it does exist. Similar to that, I might add, they might want to put this in the book if they ever wrote such a book. I could point out to you that in other areas, political fanatics, riveting entertainers, forceful orators, good old preachers, the Jimmy Swigerts, but everything from the Huey Longs, the Hitlers, Sinatra, In a sense, they are popular for the very reason that they give an illusion of, quotation marks, power of sorts. That they seem to be able to come out and command attention. That their mere name, when they say, and here he comes now, the lights go down, just to mention his name, the lights in the building. But on the contrary, if it's a tyrant walking out on the balcony and it's been dark there and they've been waiting on it, and they say, and here he comes now, Premier, Doctor, General, suddenly spotlights go on, planes begin to fly through the air, people begin to hoop and holler, and you're standing there and you begin to hoop and holler, and you don't know why. <coughs> or there you are, and they say, and now it's time for the star of the show, the hardest working man in show business and your heart begins to race, and you begin to stamp already, and he's not even there. Or they say, we'll be preaching tonight at such and such place, and you think, I'll go there. And somebody says, but he's a Methodist, and you're not a Methodist. And you think, well, I don't care. I've heard him speak. And they say, well, you're not even a Christian. It's not even the same religion as you. And you think, I don't care. And for those of you who may laugh at some other person's religion, and say, well, that religion is silly, whereas mine, even though I may not be a faithful follower, mine is obviously based upon some reality from higher forces. This other religion is just it's illogical, it's irrational, it's silly. It's based upon some kind of primitive emotion. It all gives a kind of an illusion, a sensation of a kind of power of sorts that they seem to be exerting some kind of power right there in your presence, and you are participating in it. You are feeling it. Another aspect of that is it also gives an impression that it's possible that anybody could gain a kind of power because these people were not anointed. They were not born into some line of divine succession. A Hitler takes power by force, or a Mussolini, semi-force. <coughs> a Huey Long, it seems to be just through the power of his, quote, personality. A raving fundamentalist minister somewhere with no affiliation with any organized church attracts hundreds of thousands of followers continually, and it seems to be simple on the basis of his forceful way of speaking. The people leave and they say, what do you talk about tonight? I'm not sure. Or the old joke is, what the guy, what the preacher talk about? Sin. What do he say? He's against it. <laughs> people leave and you say, what do he say? He talked for an hour and a half. He waved the Bible. He loosened his tie. He poured sweat. He stomped. He hollered. He fell on his knees. Sometimes he cried and sometimes he laughed. I cried and I laughed along with him. I had to loosen my tie. I thought I was going to faint several times. What a show, what a show. What did he talk about? I'm not sure. The molecules got moved. The energy got transferred. But what I'm telling you, a part of the pull for that 
is that the audience has a sensation, of course it's not in any way analyzed, it's not thought about, but it's a sensation that here is power that has been acquired in one person's lifetime. And it's like this sensation. If they could do it, anybody could do it. It's not like them saying, all right, there is Group X. There is a reality to the dreams of Illuminati and the elders of Zion and the Council of Constantine. And we got one of the men, one of the descendants of this line. He's here tonight. We've tied him up. We got him in a chair. We're going to push him out and let you see him. What if in some way, I'm really pushing it, but what if in some way you believe this and you brought him out? What kind of attraction would it have? You know you could never be him. That's going too far. I'm going a little past 4.1 dimensions. So scratch that from your minds and erase that from the tape. Another aspect. I might point out to you. How about how the whole world is moving into, at a faster and faster rate, the age of technology? How about specifically machines? How about more specifically? about such things as automobiles, computers, foundries, tool and die works, televisions. Could you see that in a certain way that the manipulation, the inner reaction as I guess it could be called, of the powerless, ordinary people with machines offers a kind of inane sense of personal power. How is it those of you who like to drive, and apparently almost everybody likes to drive at some time, you just get in the car and drive. What is it? You can describe it, the kind of power that you can go from here to there. My grandfather couldn't do it. I can go from here to there twice as fast as my father could even. I live here in a free country and I can get my car and drive even to another state and people don't stop me at the state line and say, what do you want? <laughs> it all seems to be psychological and intellectual. But what if I'm suggesting you it's like the molecular sense of freedom that there seems to be some things that you can control even though I must point out to you, they are inane to say the least. There is no threat to those with real power. There are generally no threat to those in apparent power. If it begins so, it's when you get new legislation, new directives from those in apparent power that they begin to cut down if there seems to be a growing sense of restlessness. They'll start cutting down, just to use one of my own examples, they'll start cutting down on the freedom for you to locomotivate They'll start restricting the hours that the populace can drive. Then they'll start taking away everyone's license whose name starts from A through W. And of course, next week, you know what comes next, everybody else. They raise taxes on all automobiles to the point that the powerless can't pay the taxes. But up until that point, technology, machinery, does it not offer a kind of harmless sense of some little personal power. I can turn on my TV or I can turn it off. I don't have to watch the old damn news. I believe it's slanted anyway. So I just won't turn it on there. Or here I'm watching TV and the news comes on and there's one of those guys and I know he's too blank for my taste, too liberal, too conservative, whatever. I'll hit my little buzzer and I'll zap him off. Turn on the radio and here comes some of that music and it's obviously based upon something I disapprove of, illicit sex, drugs, something, I can turn it off. I can listen or not listen. There is a harmless sense of power. 
How about another aspect? I should have thrown in with religion, I guess. As groundless from certain real views as prayer seems to be, can you see that it is yet another admission of man's helplessness? From one view that all of you should be able to adopt, at least long enough to hear this, from one view, prayer of any kind, a human going over somewhere in the corner, falling on his knees, going to the trouble to dress up, drive across town, pay to park his car to go into this specific building, which is number the building, bricks, blocks, woods, carpet, to go through some procedure to pay money, to contribute money, to go through a whole ritual, lighting candles, making funny things, wearing something on his head, wearing something well, draped around his shoulders, to go through a whole procedure to kneel down in front of some icon, some statue, some print, some lettering on a wall, and to go through a procedure and go to over there, and then the story is he's praying to his God. They had to go there at that certain place. There are all kinds of ways that you can look that are quite valid and you can look at prayer as being absolutely groundless. That it's got to be one of the prime examples of man's foolishness, ignorance, childishness. What it is, is an absolute direct admission by everybody that prays, by everybody that wants to pray, everybody that thinks they should pray. It's an absolute, direct, unrecognized admission of helplessness. That's what prayer is for. It's as necessary as oxygen. It's as necessary to keep things stable right now as the third leg on the stool. I was pointing out that even those in apparent power generally support religion. Let me take another side step to show you the beautiful, direct, and rich simplicity of what would be a four-dimensional continuing reality. There are governments, always have been, in some area of life's body. That is apparent control, apparent power being exercised. There are governments right now, we could name all out of several, uh, apparently non-elected governments, socialist, communistic, governments that apparently went in by revolution, went in by control, and do not seem to seek the active direct support of the controlled to stay in power. Such groups of controllers, that is, such groups that were apparently in power, not the real power, because if it can be seen, remember, it is not the real power. These governments always have something across the board throughout time in common. The governments that claim to be the ultimate power, the ultimate power, they always do so at the expense of any unseen power, such as the gods. But if you will note, these governments are always the height of inefficiency, always. If I'm not making this plain enough, it should be common knowledge to all of you. The great Russian Revolution supposedly freed them from a group of divinely self-appointed czars, bloodthirsty tyrants, an ignorant strain of backward rulers, and in this great revolution, then a new group got in power, took apparent power, and they set themselves up, to use the Russian example, 
as a non-religious. They used to state outright an atheistic society, an atheistic government, that the government, the apparent power, was the ultimate power. There is no other power. There's us. I assume, without any doubt, that all of you know that you could use Russia, by all reports, as the prime example of an inefficient government. It's just synonymous with the way in which they have been governed since 1917. It's just the height of inefficiency. And there's a reason. Well, there's several reasons. They're inefficient partially because they are distracting the powerless from being able to identify, to feel as though their position of powerlessness, their impotence, is relative to something far away. But now they're left with only feeling that I'm impotent compared to those telling me I'm impotent. I'm only impotent compared to those right at hand, that is, the down Politburo, the Kremlin itself. The other aspect is this, that no one's ever suspected. As these kinds of governments, that is, it's this molecular situation that continually, periodically pops up in life's body, it appears to be a government, appears to be a group in apparent control, and they set themselves up. They announce themselves as being the ultimate power. There is no other power on heaven or earth except us. The inefficiency, the heart of it, is caused because real power is exerting little, if any, influence in that situation and doing almost no business. And therefore, we're back to an earlier thing from this non-existent handbook that I pointed out. Apparent power must be supported by real power. And these kind of governments, and Russia is not the first in history, that set themselves up as to be the ultimate power, that there is no power but us, they are always, in the general scheme of things, you can see it in a certain way, they are doomed, they are short-lived, they're always the height of inefficiency. They never leave any sort of apparent lingering mark because real power is doing little, if any, business in that situation. Turn it over. A little bit more from this fictitious book. In such a book, if it existed, if somebody had written down some of this information, that the way things have been happening throughout the history of man, uh, at least you'd be able to piece together some things about the real power, the 0.04 percent. So let me tell you one thing that I was able to piece together from this, without any doubt. It's not any kind of speculation. It's just obvious from my reading of this non-readable book. The 0.04 percent, the real power, intrinsically perceive a four-dimensional world, and they do business accordingly. If it was a matter of cause and effect, I'd tell you there is the cause of their power. That's not true, because they didn't acquire it. If you acquire it, it's apparent power. But they intrinsically, they are born and to their part of life's body, perceiving a 4D world, and they do business on that basis and no other basis. They operate on the basis of all three dimensions of height, breadth, width, and time being continuous with that. Now, I don't compare that as confused as I'm sure many of you are. This probably won't sound like a real great caveat. But don't confuse that with activity like this, because notice I said intrinsically. But they intrinsically perceive a 4D world, and they do business on that basis, that they not only see all three dimensions that the powerless see, those with apparent power, and even the restless, 
but they can continually perceive, they're born that way, perceiving a four-dimensional world, that time is going on and that everything changes. And that who was their enemy yesterday, who was in apparent power yesterday, will be out of power next week, next generation, a hundred years from now. And it is all an absolute continuum. And time is as relative and as, as stable as the height of the current president of such and such country with whom they're dealing. They are as wide as the time it took the, the first president of that country to gain 50 pounds while he was in office and attempt to cheat them. They perceive a 4D world. I should also note for you that 3D mathematics don't really tell you much, which is what I'm doing. It doesn't tell you as much as you think it may. But compared to the 0.04% and their intrinsic perception of a 4D world from this fairy tale book of mine, Compared to that, the rest of the people perceive this kind of world. It's a world wherein things leap out of the background only if two of the dimensions seem important. Out of height, breadth, width, and time. If two of them seem important, and from this background, something leaks out, and it seems now to be your reality. Put another way, you are conscious only of that thing, those things, wherein two of the dimensions are important enough that they leap out and announce themselves and create a binary reaction on your part to it. Then if two of them seem important, then from this background, something leaks out and it seems now to be your reality. Put another way, you are conscious only of that thing, those things, wherein two of the dimensions are important enough that they leap out and announce themselves and create a binary reaction on your part to it. Then it becomes real. But notice that you're dealing then with less than the four-dimensional world. You're never dealing with that which the 0.04%, according to this frivolous book, that they would be dealing with. It would be like a binary fix, that there would be the continual necessity that for anything to reach consciousness, for anything to become part of your conscious reality at that time, it would have to come into a kind of three-dimensional relief from this continuing dull, sometimes vague background. And it has to be a binary fix it takes place and like relief like a three-dimensional relief coming from a wall artistically, two of the dimensions must strike you as being of importance. Then you are conscious of it. That is how the powerless deal and do business, whereas the 0.04% don't do business on that basis. They would perceive a four-dimensional, a continually four-dimensional world wherein everything revolves, everything is alive, and time, we're not talking simply about seconds, continuous time, horizontal time, is, um, is as important as dollars, cents, height, breadth, weight, quality, quantity, date of shipment, payment on demand, checks, It's almost a shame there is not a book like that, isn't it? Instead of me having written some of the books I did before, 
set of books that if I said I need to write some new books that you could perceive or imagine I'd write, instead of all that kind of crap, you think there would not be a ready audience for the, quote, conspirator's handbook? Could be rather short, but each, every word, sentence, paragraph, page, would be of interest if it was presented in a fairly straightforward manner. A little more organization than I've done the last few weeks, a little more organization than I did tonight. But it would not be as occult as it would be metaphysical, as mysterious, as, might, as you might think it would strike them at first. Because I repeat where I started some of this updating four weeks ago Everybody, to varying degrees, are sitting ducks. Everybody's wired up and primed to believe in a grand conspiracy, to believe that there is a small, of course, small, I've given you a hint from the book itself, from my information of that book, that it would be 0.04%. There would be no more than that. Are those with permanent power not acquired, they don't lose it, and they're not seen. And to varying degrees, everyone on this planet is wired up. Oh, yeah. Whether they'd ever thought about it, whether they'd not thought about it. And everyone is primed up to be interested. We just pass along as real information, straightforward information, here it is. You should have suspected it. It fits into each and everything that you know. It fits into every nook and cranny of life's experience. That almost anything that you can wonder about, almost anything you can complain about, can be explained right here. That there is 0.04% of the world's population continually that is really in power. And that everything that goes on they are behind it. There is, then on the visible level, a 4% of people who seem to be in control. Politicians, dictators, elected officials, bu bureaucrats of various kinds, heads of organizations, of institutions, of religions, of movements, of political parties. They come and they go. And you can see that. And now you, dear reader, find yourself in the 96% that you seem to always be at somebody's mercy. You have always, you're there at a bank with your hat in your hand. You're going to a synagogue, to a church, to a temple with your hat in your hand. You're prepared to pray, you're prepared to beg, you're prepared to expect a miracle, you're hoping for a miracle. You go to the seats of apparent power, your elected officials your friendly neighborhood dictator, and you hope for help because you are what? Powerless. Everyone's prepared to accept that, except that third group that I'm telling you does exist. They're always there, the restless, the would-be revolutionaries, the rebellious. They want to join in the power. They want to join in the 4% visible, small case P power. They want to be part of it. And they can be. Remember that. Because control, that is apparent power, you can lose it. You can get it. Then you'll lose it. Somebody else gets it. But then you've got the larger segment in that triad of those that are powerless and they remain that way. They don't particularly care. They don't think about it. It doesn't matter. Psychologically, if they were a question, they would explain it in all sorts of ways, in the same way that if you were operating at line level consciousness, you people would give a sundry menu of explanations of why you don't fight City Hall, why it's a waste of time, why you don't care, why you're too smart, why you're too tired, why you're too old, why you're too young. And then there are a group trying to get in on apparent power. But nobody is trying to get into real power because they can't see it. 
If they could see it, which they can't, if they didn't know it was there, they can't get in because you can't join and you can't move over there. You can't obtain it. What a vast potential readership there would be for such a book. And there have been, you pro people probably more aware of it than I am, specifically, but there have been a string of books throughout the history of man claiming to be uncovering some great nefarious plot by the Freemasons that they are trying to take over the world and they're everywhere. You start checking around, they're Freemasons, even in places where they don't belong. That the Catholic Church says you can't be a Catholic and a Freemason. And by God, somebody comes up with almost irrefutable proof that three-fourths of the popes that ever lived were Freemasons. Well, now, I'll grant you this. These kinds of would-be secret organizations, sometimes semi-revealed secret organizations, they are part of the restless because they're a little childish belief. I mean, they might as well be playing cowboys and Indians. But their belief is that in some way they're going to get into real power and that in some way they're going to be play around with apparent real power so long that real power is going to come along and say, well, we could always use a few good men. You guys come on. Close up this little rinky-dink temple that you guys built here. Come on, we'll show you what the real secrets are. And of course, all would-be occult groups, all the swamis, all the yogis, all the would-be Sufis, all the Zen schools, all of that, I told you, is some percentage of the rebellious. So what they want to do is join in the apparent power. And so all of them believe if we keep playing apparent power, that is that the apparent dominant persona in this group says, his molecules move air, and the followers, the submissive ones, pick up molecular movement on their little eardrums, and they believe they hear him say that he knows the secrets to real power sometimes called real magic, that we will do these kind of chants. We will draw diagrams on the floor and we'll whirl for 127 days. We'll fast for 127 days. We'll beat up on our fellow man for 127 days. We'll stand on our heads for 127 days. We'll stand on your head for 127 days. And then some way if we do this, and this certainly is not always verbalized. But it's like if we play around, if we play around, if we just start drawing whatever he said to draw, these strange diagrams on the floor, and we all get here and we stay together for hours at a time, for days at a time, and we do this kind of meaningless crap. Of course, the leader says it's not crap. He says he heard it somewhere, that he read it, somebody told him this. What's going on is their hormonal balance believes that if we're going to whirl around fast, eat certain foods, chant in a certain way, we're going to change our molecular, our hormonal balance in such a way as we're going to attract those of a seriously different hormonal balance. That is the 0.04%. In some way, they're going to get attracted to us. They're going to notice us, and they're going to let us in on the real secrets. But then some way we're just going to be, become a magnetic force and we'll be drawn to the seat of real power and we'll absorb it. We'll become one with it. The wax wings will fly into the solar heat and power of the sun if it doesn't kill us. That the sun will recognize that we put on these wax wings and we beat our little arms and we flapped and we jumped off high mountains. We did everything. We deserve it. The 0.04% in some way, fill in some blanks here, they will take pity on us. They'll recognize us as up and coming. They'll recognize us as we could have been powerful. We could have been contenders. Let us join in. It's like marrying into the family. It's like being adopted by the king. Why do people stay with these groups? Why do people believe that they're engaged in some kind of magic? Why do they take the opinions of some other man or woman who's obviously as helpless as they are? Why? In some way, we will attract the attention of real power. 
course, looked at another way. It's simply the old story that if I do right, according to some religion somewhere, if I do right, God will notice me. Same thing. I'm just telling you the way it is from a mortally, apparently a mortally, produced series of events and information collected under this title, The Conspirator's Handbook, that none of this has anything to do with so-called gods. That this imagined line of continuous secret power going on did not come from some secret bloodline that was started from the Moses' loins, or that Jesus actually had children, and they became the real first houses of royalty in Europe that there is some kind of true physical line going on in the Catholic Church, that the idea of the Last Supper and communion was an actual passing along of blood information, molecules in the blood being passed along, and that the popes, this whole line, that there was a physical reality to it. And the people believe that in some way we will attract this, or conversely, it will get attracted to us. Mm. I'm not going to really say that if the this fictitious handbook really had anything to say about that. I'm not going to say. And there's only so much I can make up at one time. I didn't get around much to what I promised of the continuing aspect, one aspect of this, of revolution, the apparent active effects of this third group of the restless, the rebellious. But let me close with a few little quick aspects of that. There could be no apparent external rebellion. There would be no apparent external viable, that is a continuing, a substantial, consequential rebellion unless there was first an inner one. And that is not the case in what appears to be the external world. When you have what is apparently rebellions are going on politically, as it would be called, there apparently has been an overthrow of some power by another one, that they are apparently now one group that was out of control is now in control. And they may be promising great things to come, redistribution of power, redistribution of wealth. But it is not truly a revolution. For those of you that may have noticed, the so-called revolutions always seem to turn upon themselves. The so-called revolutions never seem to ultimately benefit those that they were supposed to benefit. Surprise, surprise. If it was a true revolution, that is, if in some part of life's body that sector was about to undergo real change, the revolution would have to be preceded by an inner one. The, the apparent mortal participants involved, there would have to be a molecular revolution take place in them before there would be an external, continuing, profitable, physical revolution. When has that ever happened? Well, I can tell you this, somewhere in that book it hinted that it did happen. I don't think I'll mention, even if I could remember, I didn't make any note for it, but even if I could remember, I'm not sure I'd mention that. But I do believe that it, it either mentioned or, I started to say hinted, but that book didn't hint. It either mentioned or something like mentioned that this may have happened but I'm not going to try and remember or even guess what example it was. 
And I guess if I were you, I wouldn't try either. The kind of struggle that apparently is going on between management and employees, management and labor, and the unions. Remember that exemplary triad when I jumped from two to the first three legs of it. In that kind of struggle, let me also point out that the conflicts, the struggle between what appears to be the power, the sorts of seats of power and those that have no power, and still the would-be rebellious over there somewhere. But that kind of struggle, that kind of battle, that kind of war is never truly over so long as the opponent can still negotiate for peace. It's never over. Now, in case this does have more to do with a mere intellectual apotheosis, as opposed to me spending another hour and a half talking about historical, physical, material events that I'm sure some of you may think I've been talking about in this cockamamie conspirator's handbook or whatever the fuck I called it. If it wasn't that, then something you could, though, learn from the fact that a war is never over as long as the opponent can still negotiate for peace would be this. That what seems to be the actions and the thoughts of actions that are not only forced upon you at the ordinary level, but then are continually subject to assessment and regulation and condemnation In that same sense, habits, let's call all these things that get regulated and then condemned in you, whether they be actions or thoughts of action, whether it be stealing or thinking about stealing, whether it be engaging in immoral, illicit sex, or just simply thinking about it. Let's call all those habits, the desire to break those habits. In the same way that a war is never truly over as long as an opponent, as long as the enemy can negotiate for peace, can you see that if there was any inner personal relevance in this, that no habit would ever truly be broken as long as you can contemplate its return, as long as it can still negotiate for peace. The reality of that, the unknown reality of that, of course, is a prime example is this group that the powerful has seen fit to make available to growing numbers of people, Alcoholics Anonymous. Wherein, if I understand correctly, and I'm sure I do, being one, <laughs> is that they refuse to say that they are a cured alcoholic, that they say that there is no such thing as a cured alcoholic. You surely all heard that as well as I have, that they say, I'm not cured, I'm simply, I haven't had a drink in X number of months or years, but no alcoholic is cured. They're still negotiating for peace. That is the land of the powerless. Does anybody see any connection between all of this? And I return you to one of my should be rather interesting weapons I've tried to give you, suggestions, is do not tell yourself what you're doing. If you tell yourself what you're doing, if you tell yourself at the ordinary level, if you let this sense of this kind of triad internally in you, because there is not only a partnership 
If you could see better, you could see that there is labor, management, and unions inside of you individually. You would see that you are continually in that kind of mechanical triad. You are trying to negotiate peace. And as long as you can still negotiate peace, there is no peace. There is no quick, sure use of the sword. The deed is not done by one stroke. There is a continual discussion. The enemy, whatever it seems to be to you, because it doesn't matter what seems to be you to begin with. If you remember part of what I gave you from this non-existent book tonight, not only is your reality, your consciousness of you and everything else imposed upon you, it is then, by God, it is still then subject to all manner of regulation, assessment, and condemnation. Therefore, you continually believe, you and everyone, that I should be changing. That everything I think, everything that I do, is subject to some form of assessment, regulation, and by and large, just general condemnation. Therefore, I should change. I should be better. But the change is always open to negotiation. Should I change? Can I change? Should I start changing tomorrow? Should I change on the basis of being a Christian, or should I change on the basis of converting to Judaism? Should I change on the basis of perhaps being a Muslim, wherein some of the bad habits I've had would be more in the direct control of the organization? Should I change? Should I get married, then I could change to please a, a wife or a husband? Should I change because of health reasons in this particular area or just on a general basis of morality? As long as you're negotiating, the war is still on. And as long as you tell yourself what you should do, what you plan to do, or in fact, I'm going to tell myself what I am going to do. I'm going to tell me, and of course anybody else who will listen, that starting tomorrow, I am going to run five miles before sunrise five days a week. Now I've said it, now I've got to do it. I've said it, I've said it. I'll do it. You're negotiating. Even if you don't tell anybody and you get up and do it, and you discuss amongst yourself that now I'm doing it, and I'll continue to do it. You're negotiating. Even if you got up the first day and did it with apparently a little negotiation, if you got there and you start doing it, and you begin to discuss about, I've done it. I didn't know I could get this early. You're negotiating. Only those without power negotiate. The 0.04% do not negotiate. They don't have to. If you had any power over yourself, you would not negotiate. People only negotiate from a sense, from a position of no power. Why else would you negotiate? How would anyone fully in power, remember the first part, real power, the power that people only suspect in this fictitious scenario I'm weaving for you. But this 0.04%, not those that somehow acquire small capital, I mean small P power, they didn't acquire it. They're not going to lose it. The real power. Do you think those people discuss Do they discuss what they're going to do? Do they ask for people's opinion? Do they ask for your consent? If there was anything powerful in you, why would it discuss anything with the rest of you? In the triad that I designated of labor management and unions, of course, that's ignoring the old 0.04% of the real unseen ownership. That's not management. But if management was truly in power, would they even hold discussions with labor? If the unions had fully taken over and had power, would they have any discussion with management? Real power does not negotiate. Real power does not discuss. Real power does not have to tell anybody what it's doing. Real power, after it has done something, does not have to go to the others and say, hey, did you see what I did? Doesn't have to do any of that.
And then some little would-be mystic sitting over here says, well, hey, if I keep playing like it, if I stay in my closet and I chant, if I keep whirling, if I keep fasting, if I keep dancing in this little circle that this guy drew out, I'll in some way blind myself. I'll in some way shake up my molecules by whirling to the point that I won't talk to myself. I'll still my mind like the great Zen stories. And still the unspoken part that I point out to you is, if I keep this up, if I keep playing around like a kid playing powerful, in some way the great powerful forces are going to finally notice me and say, oh, okay. Oh, okay, come on. Here, you can marry my second cousin. Welcome to the family. I'll suddenly, some way, mysteriously, just through my good efforts, I'll gain real power. There's another aspect. Bring it more down to a commercial level, perhaps. The ordinary, that is the powerless, the 99.96% in the real 4D world, they perceive victory in the struggle, that is, the ability to change something in them, the ability to overcome some opponent, opponent some bad habit. It is seen more, if you'll notice in your own molecular structure that passes for thought, molecular activity, this kind of change, this kind of temporary victory is seen more as a kind of question of quality control. That somehow down your assembly line, there's going to be an area of quality control, and that's what you're doing, being involved with religion, with self-help, aerobics, running, fasting, dieting, cutting down cholesterol, trying to be a mystic, trying to get richer. Trying to better yourself is a matter of quality control, that you're going to make necessary changes to bring up the standard things already down the line that happen. If you were truly powerful, you would be efficient. And may I point out to you, real efficiency in this case, although quality control, I guess, passes for real efficiency nowadays, that magazines and articles will sing the praises of some company that spends X percent of their actual production cost and quality control. And you could say, well, listen, I spend X amount of every hour of every day in quality control. I'm trying to better myself. I read metaphysical books. I go to seminars. I am devoting a large part of my life to quality control. That is to rectify, apparently, mistakes, errors, bad work that's being done up the line, that has been done up the line. But efficiency would be to make all the activities up the line, make all the activities continually involved with quality. So that later repairs, so-called changes, wouldn't be necessary. You could not be desolately regulated through ordinary channels. You couldn't be condemned. There is nothing to fix. But what is self-improvement? What passes? And by self-improvement, I don't mean in just the most mundane sense of self-improvement. That including so-called apparent religious, spiritual, metaphysical attempts to improve oneself. What you're trying to do is to repair something that you feel as though it was broken. You're attempting to exercise quality control right now for shoddy work that you did on your own assembly line of being alive yesterday, last week, maybe 20 minutes ago maybe five seconds ago, 
My God, look how fast a single line runs anyway. But here it is, I'm doing it over and over again, and I still feel bad about it. I still feel as though this work is shoddy. But, at least you think that I am not on my toes at all. I am right now involved with a continuing attempt to better myself, to change, to grow. Right now, I seem to be involved to a, some measurable degree in quality control. But what good does that do? If right up the line, even if it was just five seconds ago, they keep putting out the same merchandise. They keep giving out the same questionable service. You can apparently then be involved with quality control the rest of your life and you'll never catch up. And if you were efficient, if you had any power, if you had any intelligence, rather than trying to fix something over and over, you'd turn around at least a foot away, at least five seconds away. If the assembly line and the shoddy work, the questionable service is being produced right there, you'd change it then, would you not? That would require a 4D awareness of the way business is done because you would have to know all three physical dimensions. You would have to be continually aware of that and continually aware of the parallel importance of time. Then you could fix things, not after they were broken, before they were broken. But you can't plan it. You can't talk about it. You can't negotiate it. You can't turn to apparently those, that is, those aspects of your personality, your consciousness, just putting out this shoddy work because it's obviously not you, not the you is in <laughs> charge of quality control and being concerned about changing. It's the lesser parts of you, the traumatized parts, the unconscious parts, the carnal parts, whatever parts. You gotta negotiate with them. I guess this is confusing enough for one night of one week of one month. But at least, thank God, the Ides of March are behind us. And the Ides of Texas are upon us. If I were to try and condense this at least into something you could temporarily tattoo on your arm for the week, I guess to sum it up, and I is obtuse or is speculatory as some of you may have found all this. Of course, anybody just arriving, I assume you found it as you should to be about two blocks south of insane. <laughs> Unless, of course, you really got here by mistake and as soon as you heard it, you thought, I'm in the right place because I knew all this was true anyway. But other than that, if you, I, I could sum it up, and I'm sure that all of you could see the importance of this if you would just remember this, let this be your guiding light, is keep up the pretenses and keep down the expenses. <laughs> task alert, task alert. This is not the same one that I have asked before, and it's not even really a variation of one that I asked you to do recently. So don't try to negotiate with yourself that you've already been through this. Here's what I want. I want you all to consider, ponder, and neuralize, think about, attempt to perceive, speculate, imagine, What could truly new be offered, presented as a shell to house this kind of activity to the public while still being able to give out the proper information? Now I said new. 
I'm sure enough of you have read and heard tales that secret mystical activities have been hidden in all sorts of forms in the past. Cooking schools, etiquette schools, mountain climbing organizations, participants in tea ceremonies, archery schools, and of course all the religions, all forms, little offshoots, little splinter groups. Any you've ever heard of do not count. And don't put wings on pigs and tell me it's new. To say, well, what really new that's never been done, we could say that this is the 21st century's final unfolding of what Judaism really meant. This is a four-dimensional holographic presentation of the heart and gentle soul of Christianity. Or that we are a group of mere writers, musicians, actors, dancers, jesters, trying to convey a sense of goodwill, good time to the audience. And yet inside all of this is housed, is hidden, except for the perceptive, a secret, another activity, another direction, another kind of power is hidden there within. All that crap's been done. Variations. Of all that kind of crap's been done, I'm asking, can any of you think of what would truly fit, to some degree, a definition of a new shell that you could come out and present to the public? It was not a archery school. It was not an allegorical mountain climbing group. It was not a band of world travelers with a secret mission. Anything you've ever heard or read about doesn't count, and don't put wings on it or try to take wings off of it. Can you think of anything that would be new that as soon as you thought of it, every molecule in your little brain, that little end of your nervous system, said, hey, I'm just sure this kind of activity has never gone on publicly, and this guy's. Can anybody come up with anything? If you're ordinary, nah, I condemn you. I regulate your possibilities. I assess you beforehand for the foregone. In regards to the continuing task of the hours reading along the nonfiction lines that I designated on once a week on meeting mornings of the morning possible for you, I'd like to at least make a strong suggestion along similar lines. It's not just limited to that morning. I would suggest strongly that all of you get yourself a good book on astronomy or if there is a good magazine, I don't keep up. But you need something on astronomy that's fairly up to date. And every day you should read one staggering yellow circuit fact about the universe. Or if you can find just a good up to date article in the New York Times or some science magazine of whatever the latest speculation or latest, quote, discovery of the size of the universe or what's going on somewhere. If you had the right kind of even in the restless area of yellow systems activity, you might be able to just take one fact and use it every day for God knows how long. It doesn't have to be a different one every day any of you who can understand it, to read one of these good ones that maybe you've read before. It says, right now, all best measurements, the size of the universe as we can see it 
and just ex know it as a fact as much as we know any physical fact. The size of the universe right now is measured at, and they tell you. And you read it and go, yeah, all right. <laughs> is, read it again and go, well, all right, I can't disagree, but I can't say all right because I am just staggered. And you should be staggered by the fact that I have some conception of this, and I can't remember it over two seconds. I can't remember it, literally. You should read that. Just stick with that one then. Read that every day. Every day, read it. Every day, read it until it makes permanent sense. That could save you the price of a book on astronomy. Just get the latest accepted fact of the size of the universe. For those of you that don't really like to overexert yourself, maybe just start off with the size of the Milky Way. <laughs> and just read it every morning until, by God, you understand it permanently. And then go on to the size of the universe or the number that they accept, and you just got to accept it unless you know something better and you don't. The number of the stars in the universe, just the number of them. Are the kinds of figures they come up with with the actual volume of apparent nothingness between the stars? <laughs> of what percent of matter seems to make up the known universe? Just read it every day. Read that one thing and two of you, by God, permanently understand it. I recommend it highly, unless you understand about the conspirators' handbook, unless you understand that you can look around and that there is, although you didn't know it, I gave it to you, 0.04% of so-called humans, molecular structures that go by the name human on this planet continually that have a real power that is not acquired and it's not lost, and that everybody else, comparably speaking, is powerless. Not for psychological reasons, not for economic reasons, not for any human reason. If that were true and you understood it, you wouldn't have to read about the solar system. You wouldn't have to read about the universe. You wouldn't have to be here. except that everybody's got to be somewhere. <laughs>